Welcome to PTG TV. This is your host, Antonio Hicks. On today's episode of Real Talk and Conversation, I welcome on my special guest, Mr. MT Strickland, co-founder of Metric Mate, a wearable fitness tracker that helps users track their progress towards their fitness goals. He is also, I believe, I mean, he, can, he can correct me if I'm wrong, a personal trainer and a nutrition coach, a nutrition coach on top of being an engineer. And now y'all know how I feel about the engineers. So shout out to all the engineers out there. MT is passionate about oh, helping people achieve their health and fitness goals, and he believes that Metric Mate can be a powerful tool for doing so. Welcome on to the show, brother. Hey, man. Pre- appreciate you bringing in. And I'm not a nutritionist or a personal trainer, but I'm going to let you go ahead and ride with that. But um, I hey, work with a lot swole. of people. He's swole. He's swole. You know what I'm saying? Hey, man, you know, I, I get in the gym. I'm not going to say that I don't know nothing. I just don't have those certifications. But shout out to ISSA for giving me the opportunity to be able to get my certification. So, he said it here. He's he's speaking it into existence. He's talking about the future. So by the time it gets long enough and I can finish up these certifications, he'll be 100% right. So go ahead and take that. And he'll tie into his product too. That's it. That's it. Metric Mate is all about being able to make sure that we get the right information out to people as efficiently and effectively as possible about their fitness journey so they can enjoy it, have fun with it, and probably win some stuff if they if they stay consistent. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's about. I like the elevator pitch, man. A lot of people. That's what we, like the, the conversation we was having <laughs> before we started the show. It, you got to have the elevator pitch ready to go. Like, it just flows off of your yeah. tongue. And it's like I was telling a lot of people, especially like it's, it's, it's campaign season. So everybody out there, y'all going to have people knocking on y'all doors, putting flowers in y'all doors mm-hmm. and stuff. Trying to, and a lot of the candidates I have talked to, I've, I've worked with them before. And I just asked them, you know, you know, what's your elevator pitch? Because I ran for office too, but I asked them, what's your elevator pitch? And a lot of them still have a hard time formulating that. So for you to just flow it off, that's a skill in itself. Because you got to know what you're about and especially what you're trying to sell. You know, and and it comes with talking about it. You know, if if you're too ashamed to talk about it, then why are you doing it? And the more you talk about it, the more you get those reads on people's faces, even if it's hard at first and it's like your eyes are like all over the place and you're not really paying attention. The more you do it, the more comfortable you get. So you start being able to play games with it. I'm like looking at people's faces, seeing when the eyebrows raise, seeing when the eyes get big, seeing when they squint their eyes like they don't understand something. And now you can start adding in and mixing in those different parts that's going to bring you into that cohesive clarity. And that's what you want at the end of the day. All right, so tell us a little bit about your background. Because like I said, you started off as an engineer. So how did you, let, first of all, tell people what you're working in as far as engineering goes. And how do you yeah. transition from working with the other co-founders of MetroMate and going from doing that to doing this? Say so, less. So electrical engineer by background, by degree, uh, focused in programmable logic controllers from the Missouri University of Science and Technology in Rolla, Missouri. Shout out, Miners. Um Took that and went in the industry. So that was my goal at the time was to climb the ladder and do all this stuff. Um, I always had an entrepreneurial background, but it's like that's the that's the 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 script that was given. So went worked for a couple of Fortune 500 companies, Nike 200 companies, um, and really got a chance to see how business works from that standpoint. I suggest that for anybody if you're going back to MBA school or if you're going to start a business, like go get a job. Go see what it's like for the people that are going to be working for you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Get that understanding, Absolutely. get that peace. Because there's a lot of things that you can build in. As we were talking about a minute ago, you can build those in as you're building your company to make it a part of your culture. So that the person that is you now, when you have your organization, feels more included and, and more protected and safer at, at their spot, you know, without and still produce. It's still and it's still productive and it's still gonna give you what you want. So I did all that stuff, traveled between multiple jobs, built up different skills in different areas. Um, it's really where I got an opportunity to be a part of Toastmasters as, and, 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 and get this speaking thing going because that's one part as an engineer you really don't work on in school. Like you work on the technical stuff, right. <laughs> the stuff that's going to like build things and make a lot of money once you get out of school. But being able to communicate these ideas cross-functionally not live in your silo and actually have these conversations that'll be able to bring a fuller idea together than just your stack that's not something that people do so took it upon myself to make sure that i got that opportunity so toastmasters i worked in business development for a while so i got to do sales travel all over the world talk to different folks in different markets about different things and so as i'm amassing all of these skills it's like one thing that i remember from my first job is that 
they wanted us to like be diversified in what we do when most folks are like real deep in what they do. Right. They're like, why do you want us to do that? And like, because the CEOs have to do everything. It's like, oh, okay. So as I'm amassing all these skills, it's like, hmm. That's what they said. I feel like I got it. Let's see what's up. So, so real quick, do you think yeah. that Toastmasters is still beneficial today? 100, 150%. Um, the, the, oh no, and especially today, because so I was thinking about this the other day, because we talk about all the time, how that, that kind of relationship, that face-to-face conversation, that being able to look somebody in the eye and articulate your thoughts is an issue for a lot of people coming up nowadays, because we're becoming less socialized and a lot more computer driven as far as the basic needs of society, like calling customer service right. is like. You don't really talk customer service no more. You send an email or you go through a portal or you do something. So you're losing that opportunity to have to take your problem that you're having and articulate that to somebody else so that they can understand it and come up with a solution that causes both of you all to leave in harmony. It's not a thing anymore. Like that that finesse, that finagle, that that whole genesis quad that comes with that face-to-face conversation is not a thing. So Toastmasters is super important. Because it puts you in those situations. And it not only puts you in those situations so you have to do it, it puts you in those situations so you have to be judged for it. And there are people with like curricula and criteria and they've been given this criteria and you're expected to follow this criteria and this criteria is going to elevate you no matter if you decide to break it later on because you've got a handle of it or you stick to that criteria throughout the rest of your speaking career. You'll have that feedback, but you'll also have that camaraderie, you'll have that support so that you're not doing this alone because public speaking is if you're like what is it two thirds of the world is yeah. like afraid of public speaking. It's a lot of people. Yeah, because I mean, even you know, like we were saying earlier, because I did toast, I got certified in Toastmasters too, and it's that's how I always looked at it because I went through a ton of leadership development, and now I see I agree, which I think is more beneficial today because we have a ton of content creators now. And I think being a content creator, you have to know how to speak. I don't care if you're playing video games. I don't care if you're doing tech reviews. I don't care if you're doing podcasts like we're doing this podcast recording today. You have to know how to speak because a lot of people will tell me, like a lot of interviews, like they say, you're a great interviewer. You know how to talk. I said, well, so, you know, I'm like, it, it, it took a whole, it took a long time to get there because I'm like, I'm a true introvert. Yeah, but I yeah. was like, you know, I learned it because I had to go through leadership development and I went through the Franklin Covey classes for leadership development. And then I went through, like I said, Toastmasters. And I'm like, yeah. that's how I kind of tweak stuff out. And I said, then I'm curious by nature. So I think as content creators and especially as business owners at yourself, when you're going out and you're talking to people, it's good to be able to communicate effectively. Because if you can't, then you're going to leave people because what they say you have the first one minute to capture somebody's the first 30 seconds, the six seconds, capture somebody's attention. And if you don't capture it, then then you pretty much have lost them and they're they're, they're ready just to walk away. And you know that from sales. Easy, easy. And and it's even worse when you're actually talking about having a company and trying to tell somebody about something new that they don't necessarily understand or having that elevator pitch, get that hook. Like this is why you want to listen to me. This is who I am this is what I'm going to tell you about. And this is why you should give me money. It's like, make it happen. And Toastmasters is a great tool, but the the easiest and the freest and the the, the less time consuming way and the product the way that's going to build your network even faster is just going out and telling people, yeah. you know, hey, hey look, <laughs> you look like you work out. Let me tell you about this technology that I'm building. You give me feedback about what I'm telling you, uh, hopefully in the form of cashing a check. Well, let's let's talk about that. So, how did you and the other brothers come together to even build out Metric Mate? Like, whose idea was it? And then, how did y'all, you know, come to the the idea of like putting something together, creating it, and then trying to go to market with it? Braxton Davis, that man, is the guy that actually came up with the Metric Mate concept. So, the general question that we wanted to answer is, what did I really do in the gym the last time I was there? Simple, easy. Um, for running, there's a way to be able to say that biking, rowing, even swimming, all these cardio exercises, there's a way to be able to say that. But for resistance training, it's like, okay, I can write down in my pad that I did 10 reps, but did I do 10 like complete reps? Did I cheat on eight and nine and 10 just to get it done? Did I give my full effort through those reps? Did I exercise the failure and what does failure look like? Like, did I go full range of motion? Did I did I optimize the amount of weight I could? Be? There's so many questions that you have 
that are getting answered for all these other fitness routines, but not for resistance training, not for your squats, not for your deadlifts, not for your leg extensions, not for your curls until now, until metric mate. So um, that's why we went on a journey to be able to design this and and figure out how to solve this problem. But Clemus Ricks is our other co-founder, our CTO, um, master of software development has has really taken this back in and and turned it on its head and made it into a, a powerhouse of data analytics. Um, and then the tap sensor is able to collect that data and get that information. I think I actually have one right here. Um, and allow you to be able to not only track and store that information, but we analyze it for you. So we're telling you, okay, you had a really good work. Like you literally had a really good workout today. This is the tap sensor. So small, compact, easy to be able to transport. Um, and it transmits the data over Bluetooth to the mobile uh, mobile app for the okay. devices. So you get that information and it literally can take an hour long workout and shrink it down to 15 minutes because it's not about the duration of your workout. It's not even about the number of reps that you do. It's about time under tension and muscular activation. And we're able to see that by the way you do each rep. So we have the opportunity to tell you on each rep, if you're getting the most efficient workout. And so now you're not in the red for 10 reps, just trying to say you did 10 reps. It's like, no, you're in the yellow and the green trying to really get what you need in a shorter period of time. So now you have the rest of your day to enjoy that endorphin boost, that that hormone extension, that ability that's provided to you for being mobile for the day. So when you came up with what came first, was it the app that came first or was it the device itself? It was the sensor. It was the sensor. So okay. Braxton started testing out the sensor. Uh, with a crude like board and that's when I first got introduced to it like he was showing me how he had put this together and like did something and it, it tracked a rep like he got to track a rep that's all we could do at the time was like track one rep and it was connected it still had wires connected to it it was not wireless like it was just literally a proof of concept and so uh -huh. taking that and creating the device that will be able to transmit this data over bluetooth to existing applications that utilize Bluetooth was the first move. And then from there, you started building the application around that data transmitter. Okay. Now, how was it able to determine like a full rep versus one that you stop halfway through or you just teach yourself on because <laughs> you didn't get that energy for that last pump or you just you just throw it up halfway? So we're looking at the the range of motion, so the distance at which with which you travel the actual resistance. Uh -huh. And so in your first three reps, we're gonna assume that you're gonna get for full range of motion. And the first four, three reps of your first set, you're gonna get full range of motion because you're you're fresh. Right. You're coming in, you're doing your thing, and and we have an expectation that the people that utilize our technology have a goal that they want to achieve, and uh -huh. they're gonna do what they need to do to achieve that goal. So you're going to get your good first three reps. Like you in there feeling great. And from there, we calibrate the range of motion detector. And right. then from there, we can lock in those ranges. And so for every rep that we see that full range, it's like, all right, or close to that full range, it's like, all right, you get great. Now you start getting outside of that threshold. We know you're cheating us a little bit. And then we can tell everything from down from there. Hey, yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, because you can. It, it helps you. I mean, because you when you, typically in the gym, you got a notepad with you, or you're keeping it on your phone now to determine how many reps you're doing. But technically speaking, you could be just cheating and say you did those reps, but you didn't really do full reps because you cut it mm -hmm. in half. So it's a way to help you measure it out, so you know how to do better the next go around. Hundred percent. And and think about it when when you forget how many reps you've done, that's when you really lock in and go beyond what even you believe that you could do. Like, you'll be sitting there, you're like, dang, am I on six? Am I on three? All right, I'm going to go to three. All right, you still go to 10. Well, technically, you were probably on six, and now you've done 13 reps. Right. You expected to just do 10, but because you did not have to focus on the fact that, or you lost that focus, and you just focus on doing the exercise, completing that range of motion, doing good form so you don't injure yourself, uh -huh. you end up doing more reps. You end up getting more out of every rep that you put up. So now you can get lost in that, that part of the workout. You know, you can say, okay, metric mates got me as far as making sure that I hit the goals that I want to hit. 
let me just go in here and make sure that I give myself the best 15 minutes that I got. And so when I leave, I know I did that. And our metric may can actually tell me that I did that and reward me for doing that. You know, like we just had our first um, quarterly prize winner from the Russell Center, uh, Richard Tobert. Shout out my guy. Now he's getting ready to go to a Hawks game and got a swag bag because he had the most points from the Russell Center Fitness Program. He got 165 points. We only needed him to get 150 because that's the minimum threshold for everybody. Just get 150 points. He got he went above and beyond. Got 165. Now he's getting ready to do his thing. So it's kind of like that that incentive motivation uh-huh. that's shown from Peloton and Fitbit. We've now translated that into resistance training and eventually, honestly. And I'm gonna say this here, and I haven't said it anywhere else. I see this being a resistance training video game control. Like you being able to put this onto your barbell, and now you're squatting and you're playing pong with your homeboy in California, and it's reading where the bar is and the ball's going back and forth, and y'all are like, "You're but you're doing squats, yeah, you're getting that full range, that multiple range of motion, that time under tension that really helps to build muscle." You don't know it. So you've been playing for the past 30 seconds. You didn't know that you really got in probably one of the best leg workouts that you can get because you were just playing a video game. That's how far I see this thing going as far as being able to change the way that people see fitness. Yeah, I mean, they can integrate it into a game altogether, even outside of doing something like Pong. It could be on an adventure quest and Mm -hmm. your range of motion, like how you moving with it. And yeah, like you say, doing picking up something to move out of the way to get to the next level or to get to wherever you're trying to destination you're trying to get to. So on the the app itself, so what do you when you on the app, do you have to select a a particular fitness program or just it's just calculating all the data? So, yes, yeah, so we have multiple tiers to the app. So it's a freemium app. You download uh-huh. the app. If you've got your tap system, it's a tap system for 199 Go to vmetricmate.com right now to be able to order it on a discount. It's probably the, the best discount we're going to have. I've said that several times. Go ahead and get over there and get one because we're going up to 199 coming up at the beginning of the year. Um, but once you purchase the tap system, you can download the app for free. And so okay. if you're somebody that knows that that works out and now you just want to be able to track your data and not have to put it in an in a app on your phone, you can do that with the tap sensor and just being able to go to the gym for free. Okay. Have fun, put in your workouts, put in your weights, go do your reps, track your data, um, and you get a limited amount of history. So you get about two weeks of history with the free version. Now, when you start going into the paid versions, which are between $10 and $50, then now you get 90 days. Uh, or you get unlimited uh, history. So you can compare and contrast your numbers over a longer period of time. But uh-huh. that's when you get access to the guided workouts, which is literally you go in, we, you, if you want to do chest and biceps today, uh, we, you can go or chest and triceps today. You can go and click chest and triceps. We give you a full chest and tricep workout that's been modified for the goals that you put into the system. Uh-huh. And now you hit start workout and we talk to you in your headphones while you're in the gym until you go to the bench press, put it on, 125 do 10 reps and then we count your reps and we say okay you got 30 second rest the next exercise is going to be lat pull downs on the lat pull down machine on 40 pounds and so while you're on that 30 second rest you're walking over to the lat pull down machine put it on 40 pounds and it's like all right we get get to work and now you do that workout and so it's counting everything and it gives you a next rest so it's literally guiding you through the entire workout without you having to know or do anything besides the exercise so somebody that's never worked out before to walk into a gym and look like a pro and they're going exactly where they need to go and doing what they need to do. That's actually pretty good because when you think about it and you think about other programs, I'm a Peloton person and I'm an Apple fitness person, but even going through those programs, you actually have to physically look down at the trainers so you can see what workout they're doing. But if you're actually describing a workout routine and you're telling them how many reps they need to be doing in there, as opposed to just saying you got 30 seconds of it, but now 30 seconds, you got to be looking at a clock. That's actually a lot more beneficial to those, to the gym rats. That's not because I'm a gym rat too. The gym, the gym love, rats love that's it. out there. So mm-hmm. no, nah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's actually, that's good. That's really good. Yeah, yeah. And then so as you go higher into the tiers, you get up to the upper tier. That's when you give me an opportunity to be able to connect with a professional trainer. So if you got a personal trainer, you got a strength and conditioning coach, or if you're rehabbing from an injury, you have a physical therapist. Now you can connect with that trainer through the app. They can see your data 
So you could be traveling. You could not be in the physical therapy office working out. You could be somewhere else in the world and you're getting that workout from your trainer, which is uh-huh. sent directly to your phone. You go do the workout. We track your data. And now we can send that data back to your trainer so they can analyze what you did. So now you not only get that accountability, you also get that accessibility because your trainer is with you no matter where you go. And then when you go back home, instead of it being like, oh, I ain't worked out for a week because I didn't know what to do. It's like, okay, I might not have done the same workout because I'm not at LA Fitness. I was at the Hilton gym and they only had a bar, a couple of dumbbells and a treadmill. Yeah. But I'm not, I ain't fall off like if I was just drinking my ties and not doing nothing for a week, you know. So now you get that ability to be able to kind of keep that continuity no matter what gym you work out in. Now, what were some of the challenges y'all faced as y'all came up from the idea to proof of concept to now actually having a device to sell? <laughs> and a lot of things. A lot of things. Uh, with the bugs, of course. I mean, this is a mobile application that's interfacing with a hardware device over Bluetooth. You go run into some issues. You go run into those 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 scenarios. You know, you'll put in a new feature. And you're like, oh man, this is gonna change things, and then it breaks something else. Like that's it, that's the nature of building in mobile apps, and especially building in mobile apps that interface with hardware. That's the nature uh, of technology in general. <laughs> dude, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm trying to be specific to give somebody some hope. But yes, <laughs> you jump into technology, you go run into those those mystery bugs, those those ghosts in the machine. Uh, so that's always a thing. That's a given. Um, but outside of that, I'd probably say contracts and contractors. That's that's the thing. Like we we, I wouldn't say wasted money because you always find a silver lining and no matter what's going on. Like you got to find that that positive out of uh-huh. any negative that comes through. But we wasted money <laughs> with people that did not do what was supposed to be done. We wasted time. We wasted energy. Um, and then we've gotten. I wouldn't say burned by some contracts, but you, you, there's some things in there that you need to know. Otherwise, you're not gonna see it. Okay. Um, and so you learn from all of these things. I'm a, we're better businessmen because of all of these things. But I mean, that's yeah, that's the question that you ask. Okay. And you, you know, these were developers. Man. Developers, builders, helpers, everybody. Like okay. I think I said it on the Russell Center interview that I did. Like I read my contracts. From now on, I read my contracts and I make sure they say exactly what I need to say to get exactly what I believe that we should get for what we're paying. Um, now, I, I guess a, another thing to ask to to coincide with that is then, so if you had other people working on the device with you, did you make them sign an NDA? Of course. Okay. Of course. Yeah, no, I'm a, anybody that's working with us in a capacity that's going to get some exposure to the intricacy of metric mate and especially our back end like anything that's dealing with code our github our, our, our cloud database um that's looking at a lot of that proprietary stuff that um trade secret stuff that yeah. we have back there then yeah no they got to sign the nda so i think the the person that came on to do some branding with us had to sign the nda because they were going to be using parts of the application that hadn't been used yet um hadn't been released yet so it's like yeah no the NDA is a thing, investors, potential investors, uh, because you're going to get into conversations about parts of the company that you don't necessarily want to get out. And even if you don't know, that's one thing. If I had to summarize it all into one thing, uh-huh. you don't know what you don't know as a business owner, period. Like you build anything, you don't know what you don't know. So prepare for what you don't know. And the NDA is a way to prepare for what you don't know. A contract is a way to prepare for what you don't know. And then reading those things is to make sure that you're prepared for what you might not see. Um, so, yeah. So now you were, once you all had the concept done and you created a device that you can test with, how was it trying to get in front of people to actually try to sell it, to get some, pull some investors in? Pulling investors in is rough. I mean, that wasn't the first thing though. Like that's the, I think that's a, I don't want to call it a fallacy because you see it, but it's kind of uh-huh. like a dream. It's it's a best case scenario that you come up with an MVP for a product and you take it out into the marketplace and you're like, investors, come hither. And they're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> his money, build more. We love it. It's like, no, that's, that's generally not how it works. Like you have to have a viable business before that actually starts to happen. Like they start coming out like snakes in St. Patrick. Like you got to be 
bringing money. You know what I'm okay. saying? You have to be generating revenue. So that, and, and honestly, that's something that we didn't understand either. So we went out there and we were like, hey, tap sensor. I'm, well, I mean, <laughs> I, now truth be told now, you know it don't operate like that for everybody. That's what I was saying. Like, and I, that's why I can't say it's a fallacy because it happens. Yeah. But it is it is a pipe dream. You know what I'm saying? That pipe bursts for a lot of people, like the lottery. Lottery is a pipe dream for a lot of people, but it bursts for a couple of folks. And, then, and, and I will be playing over. that 1.73 billion too. Boy, <laughs> it's a pipe dream, but I will be playing it. <laughs> you know, you know, and, and the same thing. So that's why it's like, that's why I wouldn't tell people not to try. Right. Like if you have an idea, if it's protected, because we do have five patents uh, on this technology, two trademarks. Um, if you have the protection to be able to go out there and share your idea and look for investment, um, and it's far it's far enough along that if somebody did try to come behind you, they'd have a lot of work to do to uh-huh. catch up with you. Which means all you have to do is stay in front of them to actually win. Um, go look for it. Go have those conversations. Go talk to those people. It's valuable. It's useful. And at the end of the day, one thing about investment is that people give money to people that they know. They generally don't give money to people that they don't know. Right. So the earlier that you build those relationships, the earlier you have those conversations, the earlier that you get people on the radar for what you're building and you stay consistent and push through, then the easier it is once you get to that point where you're investable um, to make that, to get it to happen. Now, as, since we're talking about investors and stuff, how much was it, if you, if you don't mind saying, that you all had to, you all had to personally invest to build it out, to even bring it out to want to try to sell it to somebody else. Because I know that's the first thing people always say, well, I can't start a business, I don't have no money. And yeah. I always say, start where you are. I mean, because they look at the stuff I have, even with what I'm doing. And I'm like, I've been doing this for three and a half years and I work a full-time job too. <laughs> so I was like, I started off one place and I just started reinvesting back in myself as I started making money off what I was doing. So there you go. For you all. Uh, what- yeah. I would not suggest it. It's not for the faint of heart is what I'll say. No. <laughs> uh, building a technology is not a uh, easy thing to do and it's not a very cost effective thing to do. So we um, we invested about 250K. Uh, I, from from y'all on personally? Yeah. In cash, <sighs> like straight up. Um, and that's between uh marketing and everything like the little bit that we done as far as development and the most of it was the software development because we're building a full platform from the ground up yeah so that is expensive um and then when you start talking about communicating with hardware that makes them even more expensive because now you're interpreting data and you don't know how that data is going to come in so you might have to flip that data for it to make sense and now once you flip that data now you got to represent that data so it's like it's way more than just build in a marketplace you know is yeah. is involved on multiple different levels so yeah it, that it costs to be able to do that then the intellectual property costs uh to be able to protect the idea to be able to take it to that next level it costs uh some money and then building the hardware costs money because you got to bring on engineers you got to bring on people to to do testing you got to do multiple rounds of testing you got to have multiple rounds of, of prototypes produced before you reach the one that you're actually going to be able to call your mvp so yeah, yeah. I mean, and we've been working on this thing since 2017, incorporated in 2017. So it's, it's, it was, it's not a short journey and uh-huh. it has not been a cost effective journey. Um, but now that we have it here and we have the protection to be able to, to per- perpetuate it and we have people that are enjoying it. So it's like, okay, we actually did this and it means something. So that it, it once we sell it, it'll be worth it value wise. But uh-huh. I'm cool. I'm cool with with what's been happening up to now. What would be your advice to people starting off if they have a product they want to sell? Like, I, what would be the range they want to stick to before they start trying to seek resources from other people? Monetarily, get it to work. Okay. The most crude way possible. It's not even an MVP. wouldn't call it an MVP because it's not viable. It's just, it works. It does what you said it was going to do. Then go give it a shot. Go out there and see what people say about it. Um, that's another form of market research because the investor market is a market. Go find, go see what you need to be able to provide or what they believe because they can keep you from running into a lot of, of pitfalls or holes in and of itself like that too. So give it a shot. 
Now, what's you all's? I mean, I I, I know what your long term plan is because you want to bring the product to market and you want to actually start having it out for people. I mean, what can purchase it right now because you got a sale going on too. Yeah. But yep. What's the long term goal for you? Like, where do you see yourself? Like in the next, I don't even want to say five years. Like the next two years. Next two years, um, yeah. close to hundred million in revenue. Honestly, uh, we're we're on trajectory to be able to hit a hundred k in MRR coming up next year. Uh huh. That'll be one point two mil in a year. Excuse me. I believe we can do that. I believe we have everything in place to be able to make that happen. And that's been a feat in and of itself. Cause last year, I think we had 16, 22 K in revenue the entire year, 2022. Uh, we're looking at being able to have close to 50 to 70 K depending on these next two contracts that come through uh, before the end of this year, you know? And so to get to 1.2 mil is a very feasible feat from that point. We just got to put pedal to the metal and get it done. You know, it's, it's that's where I want to be because that'll put me on trajectory to get to a hundred mil in annual revenue. And once we hit a hundred mil, then that's when we're talking about a billion dollar company. And that's where we want to be. And that's the five year plan. The five year plan is to sell this thing for a billion dollars because we've been able to expose and monetize the multiple verticals that we see for this little box. Uh, being able to work, like I said, with physical therapists, with personal trainers, with strength and conditioning coaches on a remote fashion. Now we've added a feature to remote healthcare, right. and then being able to take those metrics and integrate those into an application like ShareCare or any of the other in, uh, aggregation apps for healthcare. Now your medical provider has more data on you to be able to make evaluations on how they actually treat you. So now they don't only have the physiological data that you get from doing your physicals. Now they have the physio data, the, the the physical attributes of your body and how you function, you know, then now they can utilize that to make better predictions. And once you start doing things like that, then that's when insurance providers start subsidizing that because that anything to give a health provider better tools, better data to make decisions that could reduce the cost of care, an insurance provider is going to pay for it. <laughs> like they're going to pay for it, they're going to subsidize. It's the same way Fitbit became a billion dollar company. So I know it's possible. I've seen it done before. Now it's our turn. Now, with all that you're doing, have you seen any competition out there? Yes. No, I mean, this competition has been around just as long as we have. This competition has been around a little bit longer uh, because athletics has been in the data tracking systems since the Olympiad, the original Olympiad, where they had you run around a circle that they figured was this long and they timed you. And when you got to the end of that circle, they said, time. All right, cool. You that's data. Right. No, <laughs> that's, it that's, is. that's literally everything that we're doing right now. So in the athletic space, they've been using resistance training data tracking for years. So that's where all the competition is really dominant. Like they're in that athletic space. That's where we got told that we should go from the beginning. It's like, oh, y'all should go work with athletes. We actually have the Miami Dolphins have a metric made tap sensor in their strength and conditioning facility and they okay. test it and use it and get data from it. It's like, so yeah, we, we are at that caliber. We have that, 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 that uh, range as far as what we can provide and who we can provide it for. But we looked at the marketplace and it was crowded, but personal trainers haven't been in, invented for in a while besides an app like it's like okay an app just like writing it down on a piece of paper it's just, it's almost the same thing but even physical therapists haven't been innovative for really in this area ever right. like they use the same barbell the same dumbbell the same racks but when it comes to the the motion machine it's got all types of metrics and gauges and, and windows on it and the treadmills are telling them all types of stuff and they can put masks on your face to see like all of that is is so advanced in the cardio space, but in the resistance training space, not so much for you and me, for the the everyday people. Right. Um, and my big draw to it is that I actually have a partial hip replacement. A partial hip replacement I got right. almost twenty years ago. I'm young. It is what it is. We we, we spry. We came back. Uh, but I had to do physical therapy all the time. Uh -huh. And so that physical therapy, that remote physical therapy capability is special to me because that's the type of thing I wish I would have had 
because I was driving 30 minutes in traffic across Atlanta to be able to get to a physical therapist, and that ain't going to last long. But if I could have gone down to the YMCA down the street or to the little health club down the street, strapped my metric mate on, got my workout in, sent it to my physical therapist, there's no telling what could have happened. Right. So it's like, that it, it, it's capable, it's possible, we're going to make it happen. Yeah, I mean, and that is, I mean, beneficial too, because I, I pinched a nerve in my spine, and I think what helped me out it, not what helped me out it did help me out was becoming a gym rat now i, now I ain't ripped up now y'all see me now i say i'm a gym rat. i'm not ripped up i am i i can run you down six miles <laughs> and go. i can not last go. an hour and have two hours in the gym there but when i uh, pinched the nerve in my spine i actually did it on a treadmill running on a treadmill carrying the bag and i clamped down on a nerve so i had to go through phys physical mm. therapy myself and the only thing that was able to really help me out was to work on my core and lower back and i think I'm pretty sure that had I had something similar to that, it would actually help my chiropractor out who was there because he was asking the question, like, what am I doing to keep everything in place so that I don't have to try to go through some form of surgery and try to alleviate the pain? I'm like, hey, I've just been working out. Like, I mean, at least that way I would present, I could have presented him the data. So he actually would, it would have been helped him out for other patients that came in with some yep. of the same thing I was going through. Hey, we have a client over here. One of our patients has been coming through. He didn't have mm -hmm. to go through surgery because he was doing X, Y, and Z in the gym. This is what the data that we've shown for. And, you know, if you follow some of the same stuff that he was been doing, you may not have to go through surgery yourself. Just keep your yep. cord together and, you know, keep some of your stuff in place. And that's saving insurance companies money because they much yes. rather see you to the gym than see you to the operate table. Right. Well, it's going to cost more and more money. Yep. You, bro, you get it. And and that's that's literally the way that we want to be able to ride to being a billion dollar data company. It's it's, it's right there. It's been the the play has been proven, and so it's like now we just have to execute. So, what would you say to other entrepreneurs as they're progressing on to their journey and some of the stuff that you all, the troubles you all had to go through and hurdles you had to get over to get to where you are today? Get a mentor. Get a mentor. Um, they say the old African proverbs say, you want to go fast, go by yourself. You want to go far, go together. Um, I got co-founders, so I get it. Um, I have mentors, and I use them, and they illuminate a lot of these issues, even if I'm already going through it. And it's like, man, this is going on. I'm like, oh, dummy, you should have did this. It's like, oh, well, I could have kept going down this road, but now I figured it out because somebody's already been down that road. So it's not like you need to be behind them all the time and calling all the time. Like, we're grown ups, We have things to do. Um, and if you have a mentor that doesn't understand that you have things to do, then they might not be the right one for you. Um, but go find a mentor and I wouldn't necessarily say pay for it, pay for it in time. Yeah. If you identify somebody that you really want to work with and you really want to be involved with then show up, be, go to whatever they're doing, try to be around and eventually you'll build that relationship. But I, don't, I wouldn't put cash behind it. Coaching maybe. And that's a strong, maybe, but <laughs> mentorship, not so much because you want to find somebody that one resonates with you. Because that's another indicator that you're going down the right path. If they've been down this right this path and they resonate with you, birds of a feather flock together, then you might be the right person to do this thing. So find somebody that resonates with you. Find somebody that's been where you that has been where you want to go, and ask questions. Ask questions all the time. There's no such thing as a bad question when you find a good mentor. Again, if you have a mentor and they don't, you, you can ask them a bad question. That might not be the person for you. So utilize the ones that have stepped in the in the mud prints before you have. Well, I want to appreciate you for coming on and then talking about Metro Med and talk about, you know, your journey to get to where you all are today with getting it out there. But we didn't talk about, you know, how it went with uh, Shark Tank. <laughs> <laughs> I, almost yeah. left, I almost left that out. Da, 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 you got to cut that. You got to put that at the front, and then you got to run the rest of it. So they, so they stay to this part. So <laughs> you all got your product ready to go. Yep. Got it ready to be pitched out. You already went through proof of concept. You've already had people. You did your market research. People have tried it out in the gym, so you know it's, it's working the way it should. And so, how did you get on Shark Tank? So they have been reaching out to us for about five years. Okay. 
and and it was actually so before I came on to work with Mr. Mate with Braxton, I was actually founded another company called Batter Up, which I'm gonna jump back into because I've got heat. So bring it all together. I'm gonna bring it all together to how we got to Shark Tank. So met Braxton at a panel for the dual degree engineering department at Morehouse. Uh-huh. I had uh, the Atlanta University Center, Morehouse, Clark, and Spelman. Talking about being an IP attorney, I had never really thought about it. This was the first real interaction with IP attorney, so I started asking questions. I was like, hey, but what, what is this? Can I do this? This would be great. He actually ran a organization called the Patent Institute of Training, where he trained people on how to become patent professionals. Took a couple classes with him. It was like, cool. We ended up starting the Intellectual Property Special Interest Group for the National Society of Black Engineers, um, doing a couple of things with his nonprofit, the National Council on Patent Practicum. So we figured out, okay, you know what I'm saying? We work together well. We can get some things done. And so he shared metric made with me. At the time, I was working on another company called Batter Up, which is a baseball gamification. Got a patent on that because I was working with him and going through the training. So if that's coming. I'm, I'm going to get back to that because that's my baby. I, I love that one to death. Um, and so I started working on metric mate. And so Shark Tank was reaching out to me about Batter Up. Okay. And after I came on, they started reaching out to Braxton about Shark uh Metric mate. Okay. And so I went ahead and turned my clout over into metric mate because that's what I was doing right now. I was like, all right, bet, let's go ahead and see if we can go through this process. So got with the recruiter, went through the process, ended up taping, and didn't know we were going to get a chance to be on TV, and then found out two weeks before we were supposed to go out that we were going to be on TV. And the rest is history. But you all didn't want to sign a deal. We didn't. We right. didn't. We didn't know we did. We went in there with the intention on it. Uh-huh. So we had we prepared. We had our scenarios. We had our thresholds. We had our our chart with like, okay, if they offer this, we offer to do it. This is what that means, and this is how much that means, and all this stuff. Like, so we had it broken down and knew what we would go for, what we wouldn't go for, and he was just going for something that we wouldn't go for. And we okay. had to stick to our guns because I was sitting there like, man, we could figure out how to make this work. And nope, that's that's not what we do. When you make a plan, you stick to it. And for better or worse, you could say I stuck to my plan. I had the best information that I could have. I I tried my best to make sure I had the best plan, uh-huh. and I stuck to my plan instead of doing something that wasn't a part of your plan. And sitting around time, I just stuck to my plan. That's the worst. Thing. <laughs> so, the offer they were making you would have would it have helped you all out, but they would have had more ownership of the company. It would have been helpful, not fully. So we right. probably still had to go for some more. Well. I'm not going to say that because we, since then, we've gotten the company to the point where that would have been really beneficial. Okay. Um, but the percentage was too much. And the other controlling opportunities that he wanted to be able to have would have made it even worse. And it was like, okay, we can't, that, that's setting us up for failure later on in the, in the relationship. Right. And that's, that's just not a big, it's a little advanced business move, but it's not the best business move. And I think they did talk about a little bit of what he was trying to do when the episode. So if you haven't seen the episode, go to season 14, episode 11, check it out. Give us your thoughts. If you were yelling at the TV, send us an email at info at themetricmate.com. We always love to hear people when they email us saying, yeah, that's the first Star Trek episode I was watching and I was yelling at the TV like, don't do it. Don't do it. Get me crazy. It's like, I love hearing that. So if you watch it, you love it, you appreciate what we did and how the story played out, shoot us an email, man. I love hearing it. You might get a t-shirt out of it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because you have to know how to stand your ground when it comes to certain things. Because, I mean, just because it sounds good and it could be helpful, you don't want to sacrifice too much. Because if you sacrifice too much, you lose some of what you worked your behind off for to get to where you are. And yeah, I, I think yeah. with anybody, you don't want to give up too much of your baby. I mean, sometimes you have to. Well, not sometimes. You really do have to when you're trying to build out a corporation. Mm-hmm. But it's it's really knowing how much you're willing to give and what you're getting out of it. Yeah, have a strategy. Like, it's it's no matter what the deal is, there should always be a mutually beneficial play. Otherwise, it's a racket. It's racketeering. Yeah. It's gangster work. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Otherwise, like, that's exactly what it is. Don't be a Steve Jobs. You know what I'm saying? And definitely don't be a Howard. If y'all know who Howard Schultz is, Starbucks. Howard Schultz, just like Steve Jobs, got booted out of Starbucks, came back in. So do not be. And he gave up a huge stake of his business to get Starbucks to where it is. To well, but not even today, but back where it was like 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So yeah, don't do that. 
it's good now. Yeah. But it, it, it took a long time for him to get back ownership of everything that he lost. So yeah, you got to know yeah. what you're willing to what you're willing to give. And because I mean, sometimes it might take longer. The short term yeah, gain will. sound good, but short term gain might be terrible for you in the long run. Whereas long term gain be more beneficial for for you. You know, and and knowing your team, knowing your players, knowing what you got. Because sometimes, even if it's a bad deal, it's worth it. Because yeah. you might not have the runway or the bandwidth to continue going forward. It's like, all right, cool. Let me go ahead and dump some of this responsibility off. And again, that's that's the return on investment. That's the, your part of the return on investment. It's not just the cash. It's what kind of person are you going to be talking to two or three times a week now? Like, what kind of person are you going to be having to report out when things don't go right? Because it's almost guaranteed to happen. Are you going to be sitting around quaking in your boots because now you got to talk to this person about what didn't quite go right? Or are you going to be like, yo, this is, I got a good relationship with this person because I picked the right people to invest into my company and every all money ain't good money. So I picked good money. Let me go tell this person what's going on and they're going to help me strategize. They're going to be more of a mentor than a loan shark. And right. let's be honest. We were looking at a loan shark. So it's kind of like that's another dynamic you have to take into play. It's like, are you really going to be sitting there when the quarter didn't quite pan out by 15 bucks? Talk about, man, I want to tell them when you get that 15 bucks. Can I take 15 bucks out of my pocket and put it into the pot? I don't want to tell them right now. Which is, and, and I, I'm going to go back to the initial part of the conversation. We were talking about that and we were talking about the investors. It's crazy because that's the stuff that we do to ourselves. And it's the same thing that we repeat when it comes to like actually work life balance on top of it too, because we always critical. We we're more critical of our actions versus what other people are with their own personal mm-hmm. actions. Because what you're just talking about, you got people. The one guy, like me and my wife, we talk about it. This this guy that came up with a, um this was supposed to be this new age juicer out in California, hmm. and he had gotten and he had VC funding for at least like fifteen twenty million dollars, and he just kept getting more VC funding. <laughs> This is without having a proof of concept or nothing. When this man finally came out with his product to be able to sell, only thing it was was pre-made juice in a bag that you put into a machine and you squeeze it out. And everybody was like, how did you get 60 something million dollars of funding for something that's not even a juicer? You just got you got juice already. And so there's more work and it's, and it's more you know work on the environment, too. Juice into a bag to just squeeze out of something like you know that's that's not doing anything for anybody. Dude. But when it comes to us, Boy. which is why a lot of people now have been started talking about starting their own you know VC companies to invest in small black businesses, because when it comes to us to even ask for a hundred thousand dollars or let's even say five hundred thousand dollars, like you just said earlier, you have to have a product already to go. You have to already show that it's selling and people are interested in it. And the only thing they're really doing is helping you to come in and help you to expand out on what you've already built out. Whereas other folks, yep. and you got a product in place. Got that, got that, 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 what I call it, dinner napkin, that dinner napkin money? Yes. Man, that cocktail napkin money is a different type of life. Don't, don't buy into the hype of the cocktail napkin money. And if you can buy into the hype of the cocktail napkin money, you know who you are. Yeah, you know exactly who you are. If you have to guess, uh, could I be co- cocktail napkin money material? You're not. <laughs> You're not, because <laughs> a lot of these uh-uh. cats that are cocktail now, as you just said, they're not even cocktail napkin material. So it has nothing to do with who, like who you are as a person and what you can accomplish and the type of knowledge that you have. Is are you cocktail napkin in the cocktail napkin network or not? If you're not in right. the cocktail napkin network. It ain't gonna happen. And that's what it boils down to, man. Generate some revenue. Yeah. Yeah, You got to be in people's faces, especially if you have a product you're trying to, you got to be in people's face. I mean, the internet is great. The internet is really great, but you got to be at conventions. You got to be out able to talk to people and meet them face to face. Yeah. Or generate revenue. It's like, that's it's, it's one of two things. You're going to build that relationship or you're going to generate so much money that they be like, I'm a fool not to put my money into this money generating machine that this person has made. Yep. You know, because it's just gonna make me more money. It's like, so yeah, I mean, it's it's ways to be able to do it, but cocktail napkin money is after you sold that first company. Once you sell that first company, most times, if we're going to get into the cocktail napkin money conversation, we've already sold a company for half a billion dollars, and it's like, right. oh, sure, you got another idea that's off your half a right. billion dollars because now you're cool. viable. They're like, oh, we yeah. can invest in because we know we're gonna get our money back. You know, and if he doesn't, if he doesn't work, I'm st- it's a statistical anomaly. 
because he's done it already or she's done it already that like so it's a, it's not the the norm that they're going to lose me money it's a statistical anomaly and i take bet and they take bets on statistical anomalies all the time right yeah so but go generate that revenue folks Thank you for coming on again, man. Thank you for talking about Metro Maid. Thank you for talking about the whole process. Because one thing I like to encourage is like, well, have people on, especially small business owners, it's highlight the experience of what it's like to start off with something and to get to where it's something that people can actually hold on to and it's something tangible. A lot of people, you know, we always see the end result like on social media and on people's website, but we don't never really hear the story behind it because, and it's a lot of struggle. Like people think stuff is overnight. And it's it's not overnight. It takes a whole lot of work, a whole lot of research, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, loss of time sometimes, some some sleepless nights <laughs> because you worried about how much you've invested into it and is it going to be successful. So that's what I like highlighting when I have people like you on to the show. Man, I you appreciate the opportunity. That's how, and that's all you can have. That's 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 what an entrepreneur is. We hope dealers, and most of the time we we get high on our own supply. We're not even giving it to nobody else. We're giving ourselves hope. Like, hey, he you're gonna hope. you're gonna make it. <laughs> you're gonna survive. You're, you're not gonna go under. This is worth it. You 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 you're smart. You're talented. You're beautiful. Like, keep pushing. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to come in and share the story. Um, anybody that is uplifted or enlightened by what we talked about today, reach out. I always love hearing from folks, talking to folks. Um, and you never know. And anybody that want to get down with Metro May, if you're in the Atlanta area. We, we're doing events all the time. You want to be able to get in and 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 uh, experience the Metric Mate. You want to tap in for the win with Metric Mate. Make sure you go to our social media at Metric Mate. Go to the website, themetricmate.com. Shoot me an email. I give you mine, mt at themetricmate.com. Ooh, you'll never get an email. Get an email. Email me directly. Say what's up. Uh, we want to be able to tap in with as many people as possible and make sure that they know that they can take full advantage of their fitness journey. Start with us. Now, if you could, I always ask my guests is if you can leave the community with a word of encouragement. And it can be whatever. Hope. Just... <laughs> hope. Keep hope alive. Continue to hope. Continue to dream. Um, hope with intent. Hope with purpose. Hope with uh, clarity. And hope with concern. Because hope without concern is just blind optimism. <laughs> like you have to be concerned you have to keep your head on a swivel but you also have to hope for better so keep hoping hey brother i'm gonna pick it back off of that too because i tell people to have have faith because i want you to have that hope but i want you to have faith in that hope and you yeah. should all and you can't just have blind faith you have to have faith with some form of works in it processes built out plans that you already got in place how you gonna execute stuff and then have faith in behind all the work that you put into it that you know you're gonna be blessed in the end so stay true to what you do don't give up on hope because everything that you do and everything that you pray for and everything that you strive for eventually it will pay off and just have faith in the process itself because it may take a long time to get there but once you see it once it start happening you're going to love it more than what you would have had it been come to you a lot faster so thank y'all for tuning in again to this show this is uh, Antonio Hicks I don't start with escaping the matrix because I'm doing something a little different this season around because I mean if y'all don't know me about matrix already y'all ain't really been listening to me y'all kind of whack anyway so uh, <laughs> stay tuned every Friday for a brand new episode and then other discussions throughout the week because I am going to be talking about what's been going on with uh, Israel and Palestine because I am very passionate about that and I don't want to be involved, in, in, involved with that because they can always lead to some bad stuff in certain <laughs> communities but <laughs> right. people are going to have all types of perceptions and like nope me, me, nope yeah, I, I'm going to I'm leave I mean we all have we're going to touch on hope so we all have hope and prayers for the best and the safety of the lives of people that's over there we pray for all the lives of the lost and for the families who have suffered uh, tremendously throughout this entire war itself so i don't believe in any form of war but i think all life is precious so i'm gonna leave it at that i do believe all life is precious and i like i've always said in my other shows i think we should work more towards helping each other out and for the evolution of man more so than being bickering and then being divisive throughout life itself so thank y'all for tuning in again you can find this episode on pgdtv.online where all of my streaming platforms are located at and all of my social media so until the next episode Still I roll like guns. Uh, we got on three Jesus pieces, looking like Jay Z.